You know, he'll, he'll, he'll restore Peter back to where he was, because that's who he is, right? You know, it's like in Acts 27 and 8, Paul, the shipwreck and the viper and all that type of stuff, right? And he had the fire there, you know? And then, and then people come to him and it's like, hey, you know, let's like bring you in. We'll show you a favor. Healed everybody and off he went again, right? This is powerful, right? This is cool, okay? Uh, well, we'll read something else. Ephesians 4, 11 to 13, because I don't know why we have that, but we have it down there. <laughs> He gave some as apostles, and some as prophets, and some as evangelists, and some as pastors and teachers, for the equipping of the saints for the work of service, to the building up of the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith, and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a mature man, to the measure of the statue which belongs to the fullness of yeah, it seems to make sense there. He, Stature, I said. Yeah, it seems to make sense there, right? We're, we're called to build the body up, and we build the body up by really, you know, having our gifts and our talents and our desires and our desires flow out, you know, as we stand in this this wondrous work of God and say, wow. Because he's, what, what, what's the scripture? What he started in us, he's faithful to complete it, right? So one of the, one of the things that Paul said to Timothy, right, and I think it's really, really important for us. I remind you to keep the gift of God ablaze. Keep the fire alive, which is in you through the laying of my hands. For God has not given you the spirit of timidity, but of power and love and of discipline. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of the Lord. Keep that fire burning inside us. Mm -hmm. That's what Paul said to Timothy. That's what Paul, we got to keep this fire, this devotion, this desire, this, this delight in him burning. And why is that important? Because Leviticus 6.13. Fire shall be kept burning continually on the altar. It is not to go out. We're called kings and priests, and we're supposed to keep that fire burning. Thomas Merton said this, I think. We create this predictable world. We create a world where God does not live. But mercy is unpredictable and always comes in an unpredictable way. But when we're willing to keep that fire burning... And we, we allow life, you know, the law of liberty and life in Christ to, we, we always remember that. And we, we don't try, we really try not to walk in fear, unbelief, deception, delay. He'll birth something great in our life if we keep that fire burning. And so as I stand in this, this, this dawn of this great experience, I never expected to happen and I'm walking it out in reality. And, you know, all these desires that I have in, in, my, in me, I'm, I'm watching, you know, almost from an observer. It's like, you know, like, like the piano playing. I never thought I could do that. And when I do it, it's like, well, I can't believe I'm, I can't believe I'm actually p playing the piano. So when I'm watching these things unfold in front of me, it's me. It's, it's not a stranger, it's me. But I'm like, oh, that's where that came from. He gave me that desire. That's why I'm like in awe of him. You know, when these things happen in our life, we're in awe of him because it's like, like, wow. You know, because he, it's in us. He implanted us in us. So you know how Steve likes Richard Rohr? This morning's devotional was a new experience. Explanation se separates us from astonishment, which is the only gateway to the incomprehensible. The world feel, fears a new experience more than it fears anything because a new experience displaces so many old experiences. New ideas are not a problem. The world can pigeonhole any idea, but it can't pigeonhole a real new experience. A true inner experience changes us, and human beings do not like to change. The biblical revelation is inviting us into a new experience and a new way of seeing. Evolved human consciousness seems to be more ready to accept the divine invitation, but have no doubt the gospel is a major paradigm shift, and there will always be an equal and opposite reaction and resistance to such things as simplicity, nonviolence, restorative justice, and inclusivity. Many people don't expect from the Bible anything good or anything really new which is how we translate the word gospel, good news. So first, we all need mature people who can read text with wider eyes and not just people who just want quick and easy answers by which they can affirm their ideas and self-made identities. The marvelous anthology of books and letters called the Bible is for the sake of a love affair between God and the soul and not to create an organizational plan for any particular religion. The gospel is about our transformation into God and not about mere intellectual assurance or small self-coziness. It's more of a revolution in consciousness and a business model for buying and selling God as a product. Some scholars, interestingly enough, have, have said that Jesus came to end religion. That's not as bad as it might sound. Archaic religion was usually an attempt to assure people that nothing new or surprising would happen and that the gods could be controlled. Most people want their lives and history to be incredibly predictable and controllable. And the best way to do that is to try to manipulate the gods. 
Low-level religion basically teaches humans what spiritual buttons to push to keep our lives and God predictable. This kind of religion initially appeals to the lowest levels of egocentric motivation instead of moving us to our highest generosity and trust. Jesus had a hard job cut out for him. For most of human history, God was, was not a likable, much less lovable character. That's why every theophany, an event where God breaks through into the human realm, and the Bible begins with the same words, do not be afraid. People have too often been afraid of God and, and afraid of themselves as a result. When God appeared in the scene, most people did not see it was good news, but as bad news with fear for questions arising. Who has to die now? Who needs to be punished? By and large, before the biblical revelation, most of humanity didn't expect love, much less intimate love from God. Even today, most people, most humans feel that any notion of, the, of a divine lover is a quite distant, arbitrary, and surely impossible to enjoy or expect. The fear-based pattern is so ingrained in our hardwiring that in 2,000 years since the incarnation of God in Jesus Christ, not much has really changed, except in a rather small percentage of humanity, which is still growing toward a critical mass, Romans 8, 18. In my experience, most people still fear or try to control God instead of learning to trust and return the love of a very loving God. When one party has all the power, which is most people's very definition of God, all you can do is fear and try to control. The only way this can be changed is for God's side. To change the power equation, invite us into a world of mutuality and vulnerability. Our living image of that power is Jesus. In him, God took the initiative to overcome our fear and our need to manipulate God and make intimate divine relationship possible. So the title of this is, is Gateway to Silence. Astonish me with your love. So just, I want to just, you know, Father God, just astonish us with your love. Just just make us soft. Put a, put us in that position where, where we experience your desire and your delight and everything you have for us. Because when we stand there, it's awesome. Amen.